President Devon Woodland has just introduced Chuck Frazier of the NFO Washington office, who will now give his legislative report. And here at this convention, we have a booth, not here with the other people. My two good ladies are out here with me. I hope you'll each make it a point to drop by and visit with us sometime over the next two or three days. We'd like to be helpful to you if you have some special questions or problems. We do have some material with us. Perhaps some of it will be helpful to you. Now, as all of you know, when uh, any guy spends as many years around Washington as I have, you've got uh, somewhat the image of a politician painted on you, whether you're a politician or not. You live with it. You work with it. It's the main business in that town. And I'm always... Uh, Reminded of that old pool player joke. A good successful pool player, you know, uh, is one who's regarded as having misspent much of his youth. Well, if you spend some time in politics in Washington, you must acknowledge you've misspent some of your time because you've sure been dealing with a lot of crazy things back through the years. I mention that to you, though, only to emphasize that in our Washington staff, we are always aware of the fact that the legislative activity, the political activity, if you please, is supplementary to or secondary to our main bargaining program in this organization. We understand full well and spend a lot of our time explaining and defending and protecting as well as we can the position of this organization to bargain for better prices on our commodities. After we've done the very best we can in that field, then we spend some time, as you know, on tax bills, farm bills, some of the appropriations actions, some of the EPA interests, everything from pesticides and coyote poisons on across the board, you name it. We do try to cover it. With only three of us, we can't do a perfect job in everything, but we do try to keep Corning advised and try to serve the best interests of the people out here in the country as we can hear from you and as we can know what your interests are. The communication channel is very important to both of us. Our only direct communication with you is through the reporter. When you read some of those stories in the reporter, whether it has a byline on it or not, we do work with your editors. We do try to get out to you some reports on what we're doing. And I hope I'm not wasting my time when I tell you that it would be nice to hear from you. When you read some of those things, if you like it, fine. If you want to argue or question, if you have any problems with it, let us know. Because if we don't hear from you, we don't know whether you're hearing us. We don't know whether we're registering. We don't know whether we're doing the right thing if we can't hear from you. So I do hope you'll keep that in mind throughout the coming year. In an effort to report very briefly on what's been going on since last convention, I should tell you it's been one rough year in Washington. And I'm not now speaking of party politics. I refer to the fact that we do have one House under the control of the Democrats, the Senate's under control of the Republicans, the President, as you know, is trying to change the course of our government in several important areas. He takes pride in undertaking to keep his campaign promises. It brings me to this point. I hope all of you understand. In working on a farm bill ever since last January, all of us representing producers in Washington have had a very difficult time because for the first time in history on these farm bills, this one is being written precisely and directly as a product of the budget. Two or three years ago, the Congress established a budgetary control system of their own. 
in addition to the one that's proposed by the president. So when you see all these conflicting numbers published and all these arguments between politicians and so on as to what the budget would be in government, just keep in mind what they're really talking about is how much money is going to be made available on a wheat price support program or a milk program or a sugar program and so on down the line. Wool, rice, cotton, the rest. So when they passed a tight budget early in this Congress, they in effect set the limit on what they themselves could do in a farm bill. Throughout the action, in the House, in the Senate, and now in a conference between the two bodies on the two bills that they each produced, the arguments center, unfortunately, not on the question of what would be a fair wheat loan rate, or what it means to sugar beet producers to have a sugar program, or a wool program, or a milk program. The argument has settled down to a confrontation between budget people and economists on what a certain program would cost over the next four years. So you see all these big numbers thrown around, and the arguments then are settled in terms of what can be earmarked, so to speak, as an expenditure under each one of the programs. It is the first time we've had to write a farm bill under these circumstances. And it's been awfully hard for both the members of the Senate and the House and those of us in there who work with them to keep this in mind, naturally. Those of us representing producers have worked hard to talk about the farmer's position in this thing, the high interest rates, the climbing cost of operation, the increased tax bills, and have done as well as we can to get that safety net just somewhat above the concrete. But it's not very far above the floor. And the best we're going to be able to do will be of some dubious value. I think the odds right today, with the conference committee meeting again at 10 o'clock Wednesday, the odds have to be only about 50-50 that they will even come in agreement and report a bill out of conference and then go back and try to pass it first in the Senate and then in the House. So there may not be any farm bill. It'll pass in the Senate if the conferees bring it out, but it may fail in the House. You have several blocks of congressmen who are anti-peanuts, anti-sugar, just generally anti-program. The Northerners and the bull weevils have been fighting each other some ever since the showdown on the budget when some of the Southerners sided with the president to pass the tight budget. These are the factors and the circumstances under which a number of us have been forced to work in there this year. And when I talk about us working together, I'm talking about people from organizations like Farmers Union, milk producers, the wheat growers, the Grange, MFA down in Missouri. Quite a number of us do work together in these things we have to. And even all of us together are not able to get what we would like to get out of that bill. So much for a farm bill. Come by the booth if you have any questions. We've got numbers. We'd be happy to try to be helpful. Turning to even more risky area of interest, I was happy to see some of the old Sheridan County, Missouri boys down here this morning. We're going to visit some more after a while. I've had a few phone calls from people in the country who are involved with the banker or FMHA or the PCA. And I think there are among us a number of questions on what the economy may hold for us over the next 12 or 24 months. Now, the last thing in the world I want to do is pose as an economist or a statistician or 
try to be smart about what a banker's going to do. God only knows he's going to take all he can get. They generally do. But I would do this with you. I am in touch with some people back there who are fairly smart people, and they do follow these things carefully, closely. An ex-governor of Farm Credit Administration is a good friend. A number of us talk about these things very often. And to boil it down a little for you, if some of you may recall, I think I stood up before you a year ago and two years ago, not happily, but I think I did advise that we were probably going to end some big crops and some low prices and some tough times out here in some of these farm areas. Now, I don't enjoy this a bit, but I do have to tell you that the best economists in this country, outside the government, and now some of them within the government, are about in agreement that the gross national product will probably continue to drop the rest of this year, the first quarter of next year, and in all likelihood into the second and perhaps third quarters of 1982. The interest rates will come off again for a little while, but some of the smartest men we can be in touch with back there tell us that they are probably going to turn up again by midsummer. As long as we pile up these crops, as we were able to do this last season, as long as we're still farming it fence to fence out here, even though we're shipping abroad about all we can get through these ports and all we can sell, if we have good weather and the other major producing nations have good weather in 1982, I think the sum total of it comes down to a fact that we've still got a tight squeeze on net farm income facing us in this country. In this last year, figured in real terms, it's the lowest that it's been but since back in the 1930s, as you all know very well. It does not look too bright for the next year or so. I cannot think of any more serious way, Devon, of pointing up the need for a strong bargaining program on these farm commodities than just a plain, cold, hard analysis of where we're headed in net farm income and in markets for all these commodities that we're producing and taking to town. We're still going to face some difficult market prices unless we can draw more of our fellow farmers into NFO bargaining program and do something about pricing our own products. Now, I don't wish to close on such an unhappy note. We do have some successes. I think some of you are aware of the fact that in that tax bill that doled out in big heaping buckets full such nice advantages, windfalls, if you please, for the corporations, we at least got a few things done that help us out in the farm country. The IRS agent is now forced to admit that the farm wife is a full partner in matters of estate settlement and in some other tax considerations. There are a few other things in that tax bill that will help you if you've got a smart tax man helping you the next time around on your returns. Some of us were involved and we're doing what we could and some of our friends in Congress were working with us on those things. We beat the bargaining bill that was up in the last two Congresses. I think we're done with it now in the form that it was presented in the last Congress and in the Congress before that. A new bill will be introduced or is introduced dealing only with fruits and vegetables and nuts and poultry as a modification of the old law. We've not yet had a time to analyze it with the leadership, but it's quite possible that it is complementary to our NFO bargaining program. As a matter of fact, Congressman Panetta of 
California, a very smart member of the House, in introducing this bill just last week, referred to and complimented the National Farmers Organization on its bargaining program in the major commodities as evidence of the fact that he was trying to do something to help some of those specialty crop boys out in California. We'll have to discuss that one more with board members, leadership, and Corning before we come down on a hard and fast position on it. But so far as the legislative battle in Washington goes, I think we've beaten the old bargaining bill, and I think we'll not hear any more of it. For those of you up in Minnesota and North Dakota, I got the message several months ago and reaffirmed it just recently. Sunflower seed went in and out of the farm bill two or three times at an $8 price support level, and I kept screaming at a couple of guys in the committee that we could get 10 and a half, 11 and 12 on contract, and we sure hate like the devil to have them under prices with a price support program and spread the crop all out over six states and spoil the market. He had an industrial user crowding him, so he put the little thing in and he slipped it by on the House floor one day. Fortunately, last week with a couple of good friends in the committees, we got sunflower seed back out of the farm bill. So if that bill ever passes, at least we got it out of there. <laughs> Devon, at this hour of the morning, I'm not very brilliant, and I've probably already unloaded more than I know. I would like to close with one note. You probably noticed a couple of signs and a little indication around here. We're having a reception Wednesday night as a means of raising some funds for our political action committee. The committee is composed of members of the board and one state president. I know some of you have known something about it. We discussed it in the resolutions committee. I'll not bore you with a lot of details or try to twist your arm this morning or anything of that sort. I can assure you that it is cleanly and well handled, legally handled. It is used in the interest of the membership of this organization with our friends in the Senate and in the House. We do have some friends there. And it is a necessary part of operating in our form of democracy. Whether we think we like politics or not, when I get disgusted with it some days, I think it's, you know, pretty bunch of big bunch of sour apples or something, but I have to admit, compared to some of the other systems that are operating around this world, it's pretty sound after all. And I like to think that our people can participate in the process just like the rest of the good American citizens. So come by and see us at the booth. We won't nick you very hard. It's, it's a fairly cheap operation. You might win a long, big, beautiful trip for two on a major airline. How'd you like to go to Europe? It's a good shot. Come to the reception. Come by the booth. Talk to my nice ladies. They'll be happy to see you, and they've got some tickets. With that, I look forward to seeing more of you around the convention. Thank you so much. Vice President Bob Arndt, who has served in state office, district office, who has served on a member, as a member of the National Board, and is now the National Vice President. And I'd like you to give him a warm welcome as he addresses the convention this afternoon. Bob. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you. Thank you, Devon. Let me first of all express to you my appreciation for the opportunity to be able to serve and represent you across this great land of ours. To have the opportunity to represent you in the greatest farm and ranch organizational structure ever put together. You know, it's a good feeling 
It's a good feeling when meeting with other organizations, other civic groups, or people in the political arena to know exactly where we stand, where we're going, and how to get there. 20 years ago, we predicted and we foretold the economic conditions that were going to be taking place today in this time. We had the answers then, and we have the answers today. When others only talk about the problems, they only discuss solutions and then dispose of them through for political expediency, we can, with full confidence, present our plan for economic stability and be right. Ladies and gentlemen, we're on track. Collective bargaining. Collective bargaining has been accepted by the industry, is respected in the political arena, and it's wanted by the farmers and ranchers in this country. What I'm going to say to you now might surprise some of you, but we took a poll about six weeks ago. We hired a highly qualified company that took a study, a poll of farmers in 10 Midwestern states. And from that poll, we learned that 74% of those farmers that were polled and interviewed felt that collective bargaining, nationwide collective bargaining in agriculture and the National Farmers Organization was needed. It's a matter of understanding just exactly what we're all about. Not only do we know where we're at, that we know where we're going and how to get there and have the programs and the structure to carry through, we're respected by the political arena, accepted by the industry, and seen as needed by three-fourths of the farmers and ranchers in this country. Ladies and gentlemen, that makes you, the leaders, and this convention the most important gathering of agricultural leaders that's been held this year or that's going to be held. You're in a position to set forth economic stability, and you're in a position to carry through. This poll pointed out something else that might surprise you. It didn't surprise me. It's something that only verified what I've known all along. Those farmers that were interviewed pointed out that they did not see the national president or the national vice president as the key leaders of the National Farmers Organization. They did not see the national president or the national vice president as the image builders of the organization. Do you know who they seen as the key leaders? It was the county president, the county officers, and those that deal and work with commodity programs in the country. And I can understand that. As a producer, I live with and I see every day the leadership in the country. The image that you set, the leadership that you give, will determine how fast we're going to get the job done and when. I know why you're seen as agricultural leaders. You're seen as agricultural leaders because there are many forces that affect agriculture. You have the forces of production inputs. You've got the force of money availability, the weather, decisions. I can go on and on. But the greatest force of 
that affects agriculture is the force of your production. It's the force that gives buyers the ability to buy cheap raw materials and make a profit. It's the force that gives the buyers and distributors and merchants, retailers, the ability to get cheap raw materials and use that product to keep farm prices low. It's the force that you put your labor, your capital, and your hopes into. The force of your production will either make or break a farming operation, a community, or a society. All other forces will adjust to the way that the force of your production is marketed and sold. That's why you're seen as a leadership in the country, because you're recognized as having the knowledge over many years of experience, of having the ability to direct that production, having the professionalism to guide and direct that production in a direction that will benefit the people in rural America through nationwide collective bargaining. It's a force that this organization is going to continue to build on. But even though we're seen as leaders, those who are not yet with us will not come to us. There are many reasons. Perhaps it's pride. Perhaps it's fear of the unknown, skepticism, or for whatever the reason might be. You and I must reach out to them. Let them know what we have to offer, what we've put together, and how they can be part of us. To do that, it takes confidence. It takes confidence in ourselves and in the programs, and commodity programs that we've got so that we can tell others about them. And to have that confidence, we've got to feel comfortable about what we're talking about. We've got to feel comfort comfortable about two questions. I believe in the minds of those within agriculture and many of those on the outside of agriculture. And those two questions that we must feel comfortable about are, are these. Are the objectives of the National Farmers Organization honorable? And the other question is the, objection, ob the objective of the National Farmers Organization reasonable? Is what we're doing, is it honorable? Can we satisfy ourselves that we can talk to others and honorably point out to them that what we're doing is right? Well, agriculture is the largest single industry in the world. You and I, as producers of food and fiber, bring forth out of the soil three-fourths of this nation's new wealth every year. That new wealth in the form of food and fiber is brought forth, and it's the product that this nation uses to export so that we have the ability to import the oil and commodities that this nation demands. And I'll never understand why the policymakers of this country have set forth a policy to use our agricultural commodities and dump them into the world market at half price and then import the commodities we must use at full value. And then, and then increase the national debt by 60 to $80 billion a year and cover it up. It's absolutely ridiculous. And I want them to explain to me why we ship our commodities into the European economic countries for half value. And then those countries take our grain and put a tariff or a tax on that grain, sell that grain to their people in their country at full fair value to protect their economy, and then use that tax money and that tariff money to subsidize their agriculture, 
and then to take the excess agricultural products they have and ship them into this country to undercut the prices that you and I as farmers should receive, the ones who paid the whole bill to begin with. I want them to explain that to me. And those same people, in an article that I recently read, said that food is too important to let the farmers